This SciShow video is supported by Giving What We Can, an organization that exists to help you find and donate to the charities that can do the most good per dollar donated. Head to givingwhatwecan.org slash scishow to figure out how to get the most impact for your donation. People tend to be fascinated by their ancestors. We wonder what they were like, what they did, and what they'd think of us. I can't be alone in wondering if I'm related to someone famous or historically significant. Like, what if I'm descended from royalty? Did my ancestors make anything that's still here today? And while family trees tend to get murkier the further back you go, we do know that at some point, all our family trees connect up and there's someone who we're all related to. We're the same species after all, so we have ancestors that we all share. And the very first person that we can call an ancestor is called the most recent common ancestor for our species. While we'll probably never know their name, there are a lot of ways that we can narrow down when they lived. And as it turns out, that's probably not as long ago as you'd think. Think about a family tree. The most recent common ancestors of you and your siblings would be your parents, while the most recent common ancestor for you and your cousins would be your grandparents. The most recent common ancestor is like that, but for every person alive. So how can we find out who that person is or when they lived. In the era of DNA ancestry tests telling us that we're 2% Sri Lankan or 3% Scandinavian, you'd think we could just use genetics to reveal who our most recent common ancestor is and where or when they lived. But it's actually really hard to trace your ancestry that far back using genetics alone because of how you inherited those genes. For 22 of our 23 pairs of chromosomes, we only get half of each parent's genes, plus genes get reshuffled on chromosomes and swapped around during meiosis, which is the process that makes our egg or sperm cells. And which genes you get is random, meaning that two siblings can have a really different assortment of genes from each other, even though they're both equally related to their parents. So genes actually end up dropping out of the pool pretty frequently, which means that to look at an unbroken lineage using genetics alone, you'd have to look at DNA that doesn't get reshuffled or split up. Fortunately, we happen to have two ways to do that, and there's one for each biological sex, which is kind of convenient. Both of these types of unshuffled DNA can tell us about our distant ancestry, although even using one or both lines of evidence won't get us to the most recent common ancestor, for reasons we'll explain later. For biological females, we can look at mitochondrial DNA, which gets passed down directly from a mother to all of her offspring, since the offspring's mitochondria originate from within their mother's egg cell. For biological males, we can study the Y chromosome because it's passed from fathers to their sons and is also conserved basically intact. So you can trace that DNA back to the most recent female or male that we can genetically tie to all biological females or males alive today. These unknown individuals have earned the biblical names mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosome Adam. They didn't necessarily know each other, though, biblically or otherwise. They might not have even lived at the same time as one another. We can work backwards to figure out roughly when mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosome Adam lived by counting up the mutations in mitochondrial or Y chromosome DNA and multiplying that number by the average rate of mutation in order to calculate how long it would take for that many mutations to arise. Current estimates say that mitochondrial Eve lived about 99 to 148,000 years ago, and Y chromosome Adam lived about 120 to 156,000 years ago. Now, unlike their namesakes, Eve and Adam are by no means the first people of our species, nor were they the only people alive at the time. They're just the most recent people that had the mitochondrial or Y chromosome DNA that all current mitochondrial and Y chromosome DNA is descended from. And even though they are common ancestors to all humans, they aren't our most recent common ancestors, not by a long shot. That's because our most recent common ancestor isn't sex-specific. Someone could be related to humanity's most recent common ancestor through their mother's mother's father's mother's father, but they have to be related to mitochondrial Eve through their mother's 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 mother and so on. Basically, the most recent common ancestor is a shortcut connection that our genetic analyses alone can't trace. And there are millions of potential lineages that could connect you to the most recent common ancestor, but only one single lineage that can connect you to Eve or Adam. So if we can't find out who this person is using genetics, we have to use a different strategy to figure out when our most recent common ancestor lived. Math. There's a general equation to figure out when the most recent common ancestor lived for a population or species that mates randomly, which gets more accurate as that population's size increases. The equation assumes that the population randomly mates, meaning any given male has roughly equal odds of mating with any female in that group. But humans don't mate randomly. 
at all. We mate within social groups in our geographic area. And not only that, but the geographic areas where we've been able to go have changed dramatically through history. As port cities opened or closed, trade relationships between the various nations changed, and technology to get from place to place changed, too. All of that affected how humans could get around and, uh get around. So to figure out our most recent common ancestor, you have to factor in all that, too. In 2004, researchers tried to do just that. They used population sizes, geography, birth rates, and historical migration patterns to model how frequently people from one area might reproduce with people from another area. Now, these are estimates about human populations living hundreds or even thousands of years ago, so it's tough to model these trends with complete certainty. The research team ran the model under several different scenarios to come up with an estimated time range. And the model suggests that the most recent common ancestor of everyone currently alive lived around 1400 BCE, and possibly possibly as recently as 55 CE. For context about how recent that is, we're talking about someone who could have used a sundial to tell time, made glass, or had the opportunity to read a surgical manual. So to answer my question about what my distant ancestors' lives were like, it turns out that they could have been doing all of those things, too. And to go a little further back, the Great Pyramid of Giza was built around 2500 BCE. So it's entirely possible that I am related to any of the people hauling rocks across the desert thousands of years ago. We could all be related to them, every single one of us. All of this math and genetics is just more evidence that the lines that we might draw separating people today are largely arbitrary. If we can go back just a few thousand years to when great, great, however many greats grandpa could have been working on one of those world's great wonders, how different can we all really be? And at this year's end of year family reunion, you can come together to do some good with giving what we can. They're an organization that aims to help you find and donate to the charities that can do the most good per dollar donated. Giving what we can isn't asking for your money, and they don't take a cut from your donation. Their website is full of free resources to find great charities, and they spend their resources working with experts to identify the most impactful causes and the best charities working on them. They've identified over 30 top-rated charities and funds working on high-impact causes, like reducing poverty and illness, addressing climate change, and advocating for farmed animals. And their top-rated organizations have been vetted by expert evaluators, so you know your donations will be used effectively. To make the most impact you can when you donate this holiday season, you can head to givingwhatwecan.org scishow. Thanks to Giving What We Can for supporting this SciShow video.